Balake. Where is Balake at? My name's Blake. Do you want to go to war, Balake? I'm for real. A.A. Ron. A.A. Ron is here, everyone, with Sterling Tompkins once again. I'm looking forward to this chat. How you doing, Sterling? I'm good, man. Good morning, dude. Well, afternoon for you. Good morning for me. So, it is afternoon for me. Yeah. Can you tell how much water and sweat I have on my head right now? Does it come through in the camera? <laughs> You're red. You're red, but that's but that's it. Why? Did you step outside for half a second? <laughs> I think in the last 60 minutes, I have... Um, I have eaten, gone for a swim, done some laundry, jumped in the shower. I got out of the shower like seven minutes ago and I'm, I take very hot showers and I'm still sweating. <laughs> oh, we could have pushed it out 30, man. I was watching no, 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 David. No, 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 David no, no, no. It's, 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 I get more done when I have less time to do it. So <laughs> on, it's like, it's I, really, if I have more time, I'll get yeah. even less done. Um, <clears throat> okay. okay, so we we are talking about um, your mom, Biddy Miscavige. I, I know her as Biddy Miscavige. I know she goes by Biddy Blythe, her maiden name. Uh, and your former sister-in-law, Shelly Miscavige. Yes. We've been having some really interesting conversations about this because you got an email from a former Sea Org member. Uh, now, I, now, you've told me the identity of the person, but I don't know who – I've never known the person. They were at the ant base with all you guys? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. And this person proposed that the reason Shelly Miscavige was sent off to the secretive Scientology base in the mountains, uh, instead of being sent to the hole where everyone else was sent, is because she's someone who could have rallied the troops, troops and staged some sort of a coup and kind of removed David Miscavige from power. And a lot of people have a lot of really interesting opinions about this, including uh, your mom, who is, let me bring her up in this photo here. This is a, a photo that was published back in the nine, late 90s, in a Sea Org magazine showing David Miscavige and his personal staff at RTC. And what you have here, what I find amazing about this photo is that your mom, oh, I can't scroll on this. Your mom, I don't know, can you see my cursor on the screen? Yes, yes I can. Yeah. Your mom is more prominent in this photo than Shelly Miscavige is. Your mom's over here, that's Biddy, and over here is Shelly Miscavige. Now, in this photo, correct me if I'm wrong, is Shelly, at the time of this photo, she is David Miscavige's assistant and your mom is Inspector General or Deputy Inspector General? She's DIG at that point, yeah. She's DIG. So honestly, truly, in some literal terms, second in command of Scientology. Yeah, yeah, I would say so. I would say yeah. so. And you asked your mom for her opinion on this Shelly potential Shelly takeover. Oh, oh, I, I digress. This is Sterling Tompkins' channel right here. <laughs> if you're not yet subscribed, look, you're almost at 6,000, dude. That's awesome. I know I'm getting there. It slows down. It's funny, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm getting there. I'm getting there. <laughs> uh -oh. Yeah. Okay. So you asked your mom, Hey, what are you, what are your opinions on this proposed potential Shelly, uh, Miscavige coup theory? And what, what did she have to say? Well, and I specifically asked that interesting question about whether if she asked some of the existing executives at the time, mm -hmm. we're talking your, your Mark Yeager's Guillaume Reserve. Mark Ingber, any of any of the core core executives at, at the international base at the time, what if if Shelley had come down and said, "Hey, Dave's off the rails. We got to do something. Let's jump on this. Who who who's with me?" Biddy said, without a hesitation and, and and when my mom does not hesitate that means she's pretty sure about something again all conjecture but she goes we would have never followed shelly <laughs> we would have said absolutely no not doing it and that would have been the end of it and and the whole would have started a lot earlier um <clears throat> that being said though that being said and we'll get maybe get into this a little bit later i was talking to my brother justin about it too who knows them um and one second. Oh, um, talking to my brother Justin about it later, and we were we were going over theorizing about how many people, if if that were a scenario that was possible, and you did get a Guillaume, a Mark, a Mark Ingber, Mark Yeager, and and started gathering it. What would be the break point? What would be the point where you possibly could do something? Provided, by the way, you'd have to cut David off from contacting lawyers at that specific time. Uh, so the, we, we talked about, you would need, you would need about four to five executives at the upper, upper level to possibly pull that off. But then you would have to have to 
include people from security because security, believe it or not, even though these executives are way higher than security on the org board, if you didn't have the security chief of gold or his staff involved, those are the people that could lock up the executives at David's whim rather than have a direct takeover. So it's it's interesting when you try to look at it from a mathematical point of view of where the make break point might have had to have been for that to be successful. Uh, and maybe something we could talk about a little bit later, but I find that just the concept of it, it is fascinating when you think about what could have been or might have been done at the time. But I went off. Uh, no, no, I, I think Biddy is is pretty accurate. She did know all the executives pretty well. And she said, no, we wouldn't we wouldn't follow Shelly um, at all in that particular scenario. And there's a couple reasons why she said that. One is Shelly, she believes Shelly was an absolute true believer, for sure dedicated, but a little off the edge about it. She was, for lack of a better word, quirky. Uh, quirky and not as definite or or finite in, in what she was able to accomplish or how she would go about something. So she didn't think that she would have the ability to pull something off like that. Now, a lot of people, again, like you mentioned, no one really even knows who Shelly is today or have seen her, but people that did know her back then would kind of say that no, she couldn't, she couldn't have done that just based on her personality, not whether she would have or not. That's a different argument. Could she have? And so I found that pretty interesting as a, as, as a statement that people would still go for the person beating them over, over Shelly, who obviously um, had a longer tenure with L. Ron Hubbard himself. So hmm. okay. Yeah. So when she says that um Shelly was a true believer but even a little bit over the edge and quirky about it. Do you have any idea like what that means exactly? I think, yeah, I do. I think it's like, like Shelly really believed in the reincarnation, the, the whole kind of story of, of Scientology, the core beliefs of it more. So I don't know how you put it, but you, you could have you could have a sort of a corporate view, which I think is what Dave Moore has to Scientology, a more business oriented view where it's let's make money, let's do this, uh, you know, plan out dissemination and, and all the things that factually make Scientology and is why Scientology is really a business, not a religion. Shelley was really a religious zealot for Scientology. Does that make sense? Oh, for sure. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Um, in some ways, I feel like that's that's a good description of kind of my version of Scientology belief. I was more, um, I think if you believe it more in that, um, well, I want to say religious nature, but what I really mean is if, if you're believing more of the fundamental, the spiritual nature of the Scientology belief system, uh, you know, eternal spiritual beings, we're sort of trapped here in the prison planet, in the physical universe, this sort of like uh, that earth is kind of like this psychiatric created prison in the physical universe that we're being held in. Only Scientology can unplug us all from this matrix. And, you know, helping people is more important than making money. I might go so far as to say most Scientologists believe in that version of Scientology or that aspect of Scientology as opposed to we should just be trying to make as much money as possible. Right. Uh, what, do, what do you think? Like what, what was how, what was your level of belief? Well, uh, and so I obviously never worked really on management lines. So I think my level of belief was I was enticed. I was amused. And I'm going to admit that I, I, I do believe in aliens, guys. Sorry. Uh, or at least that we're not the only intelligent species in the universe. But I, you're enticed a little bit about the possibility. I mean, L. Ron Hubbard was a master storyteller. He told so many different uh, genre of stories from Westerns to sci-fi. And so when he did talk about uh, Fourth Invader Force or these, these stories of how Earth became inhabited and stuff like that, there was always a, a corner of my mind that, that, that wanted that to be true. And that was fascinating. As I progressed in Scientology or in my Sea Org career, though I got more and more disillusioned with the actual technology because I, 
as you know, at a certain point, at a certain level, you stop really getting Scientology. And now it's just about interrogations and, and reading these ridiculous courses that were outdated that were written in the 60s that don't really apply to today. So I always enjoyed the thought or just the idea that there was something else and was willing just to work my hardest and do what I had to do to stay around long enough so that I might see something like that come to fruition. I believe that your Mark Yeagers, your Mark Ingbers, your Guillaume Lazurs were so locked into the management half of it. And because statistics are so important in that, uh, important in that uh, sphere that they eventually lose sight of what is Scientology or what it was going for. And they're just trying to now get the, the graph, the stat to go up. Uh, if that makes sense, I think they, I think the system is built so that you tend to forget why you're there. And, and we could argue, and we've said it before that most people in the Sea Org are really there because they believe they're going to help someone because they're not there for the money and they're not there for the time off. Uh, they actually truly believe, which makes them, which is what makes them such a great workforce. They're not there for the perks and the benefits. Or no, the they're not. <laughs> so what I find interesting though, <clears throat> And maybe it's hard for you to speak for your mom on some of these details because you mm -hmm. probably, I don't know how in-depth your, your questioning of her was on this, but I find it interesting that her commentary on the nature of Shelley's belief would have been part of the reason why they would be unlikely to have followed her as opposed to like, like I thought it would have been the reverse. Like, oh yeah, no, she was a true believer. We knew she was there for the right reasons. We knew she, you know, was there for LRH and we would have followed her for that reason. But it sounds like it was almost the opposite. Right. And yeah, and I think it's I think that's because of what I just mentioned again conjecture is that these guys maybe saw okay, Dave is the one trying to increase the stats, trying to push things up. For lack of a better word, maybe they thought a little bit that Shelly was a little bit feedy weedy. And and I don't know That's a great that's, Scientology word. I I don't even know the real world equivalent to that phrase. I, I was going to ask you, do we even know if that is a Scientology phrase? I mean, it's used. But sweetness and light. But is sweetness and light a Scientology phrase? I don't even know. Sunshine. Like just, yeah. um, I honestly don't know. It's, I, don't I don't either. Know. I'd love to look that up sometime because it's a word that we heard so many times, right? Uh, let me let me Google it and see what even exists on <laughs> Google. If if someone put up like a, a, a definition, Scientology definition of this. Because I know there is in the Scientology dictionary a definition of Thede Weedy. Okay, hold on. Mike Ringer yeah. did a whole blog post on Thede Weedy. Being Thede, Thede really? Weedy in oh, wow. Scientology. Thede Weedy is one of many negative Scientology terms used to label a person. Such people appear bubbly and upbeat, happy and cheerful, and without <laughs> a care in the world. Behind the facade, though, is a person scared of life. Oh, L, L. Ron Hubbard defined Thede Weedy as one, slang from England, meaning sweetness and light. Oh, so that's why Scientologists say sweetness and light as well. It's right out of that Scientology oh, dictionary. Okay. Sweetness and light, but they can't face mest. Mest means the physical universe. Yeah. Or any outness. Outness means something that's wrong. They cannot face mest or outness. They cannot go deeper into the bank, which means the reactive mind, than a thought. Uh, definition two, wow. he operates in a totally psychotic way while being totally serene. The valence, which means personality, is all the way up at tone 40, and the PC is all the way down at minus eight. Okay, so it's a slur in Scientology to call someone yes, Weedy. For sure. Okay, and, and you, what, you just, what we, yeah, I, I've had a misunderstood word my entire life. I had no clue that was the actual definition of that word because it's a <laughs> slur. Because it's a slur. Right. Yeah, it's an insult, essentially. Okay, so why were we talking about Thede Weedy? I forget. Oh, because because I think I think that the executives at that time, your Guillaume, your Mark Yeagers, Mark Ingbers, would have considered Shelly slightly Thede Weedy. And I think, and I don't want to speak for my mom, I think that's how she saw it. One is this man, strong <clears throat> management, get it done personality. The other is this Scientology, it works. Oh. And I think they'd rather follow the stronger person, even if he is wow. being abusive. Yeah. Wow, that, you did a great job explaining that. That makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah. Wow. In some ways, because I did not know your mom was DIG, but right. knowing that she was and seeing her in that photo, in some ways, I kind of would guess that your mom would be one of the people that the guys, the people up there at management at that time would have been more likely to follow in a coup than Shelly. I would say yes. I would say yeah. And because she, because, because. Biddy had a particular, my mom had a particular thing too, where she really didn't care that much about 
what Dave, like she wasn't, there was some fear and she's told me there was some fear of Dave. There always is, but on, on a scale of one to 10, her fear level of Dave was maybe a one, whereas everyone else's was like an eight. And that's just her personality. I don't think, I don't think she was trained that way. I don't think she was taught that way. That is who she is. She just was like, oh, I don't care. And if it, if it, if it comes too far, if you come too close to me and you get in my face, I'm just, I'm either walking away. Now she's told me, she's told me, and I'm sure other people have admitted the same thing. Quite a few people there will tell you they wish at some point they had manned up, got a pair of balls or whatever the equivalent for a lady is. And, <laughs> and just said no, because you could argue that at any point someone could have actually done that, whether it was successful or not, they maybe would have at least felt better about their tenure there or about the time they spent there. If they had stood up and said something at some point. Yeah, it's true. I mean, <clears throat> the result of saying no, as, as long as you keep saying no is going to be you leaving the Sea Org. Yes. And I guess you will have stood up for yourself and you know, eh, from a Scientology perspective, have accomplished absolutely nothing. Right. Like, because you say, no, 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 go to the RPF, no, then get the hell out of here. Yeah. And then you go, okay. <laughs> yeah. I mean, realistically speaking, you would have had to have masterminded enough people together again. And, and, and I would love to talk to Jackson about this, which hopefully I will get to. I really think even if you had, even if you had half a WDC, Half of the uh, executive ints at the time in exec strata all stand up at one point and say, no, if you didn't have HCO or security, Dave would just march them up there and lock you in the building. Right. So I think that was a, that was a, a key, key factor in, in controlling that, which is also why I think Dave Miscavige kept security so close to his chest. I think he really did. That's why he always had a direct line to your Jacksons, to your Kenny Siebold's, to your Uwe Stuckenbrock's. Always had them in his hip pocket because I bet he thought that could happen at some point. And, and he just kept being more abusive and more abusive and was like, maybe at some point they will turn on me. But guess what? If you've got a bunch of big security guards against a bunch of pencil pushers, essentially, who's going to win that battle? We right? should have this conversation sometime with Jackson as well. Absolutely, we should. And maybe even at some time, Jackson and your mom. Yeah, right. Or, um, or I want, yeah. Because yeah. Jackson, because right, because because Jackson is one of those guys that Miscavige would have kept in his, uh, you know, very close to him, knowing that, honestly, you know, the real authority comes with the security guards. They're the muscle. Yep. And you can, and also you could say no to Dave all day long. No, 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 no. And you, you could prevent his orders from being executed, perhaps, but that's not the same thing as getting rid of him. Like, even even if the security guys had gone along with some sort of a coup, and I don't know, I don't know, like, what does it even mean? Do you lock Dave in a room? Like, like I don't know how, yeah, yeah. What, like, I don't even know how so, such a thing proceeds. Right. Even if you lock him in his room or, or whatever, yeah. uh, you don't have the relationships with the lawyers. Right. But, but you could get to them. Right. So I'm, I, again, I've been thinking about this quite a bit and, and I've talked to Justin about it too. The, the scenario, the only scenario where I think that would have worked is you, you put someone to, you, you cut them off. You just start saying, we're doing our own thing. You have securities agreement. So he can't get off the property. You put someone to shadow him and you just don't, you disconnect all the phone lines near where he's at. So he has no option. He just has to run around the base. He doesn't have a way out. And then you've got to work behind the lines with whoever else you may know has contact to find out which the lawyers are, how you have to do stuff. Again, all conjecture, all just imagining what it could have been, which is kind of interesting to do it with 2020 hindsight, but that would have been the way to do it. And you would have absolutely had to have had a few of the lieutenants. Now, you ask me, I guarantee you Marty would have never gone for it, to be honest with you. I think he would have blocked it right away. And he has enough power himself to stop it, too. So so just yeah. because of his loyalty to Dave at the time? I think so. I think so, yeah. Yeah, and, that, I, and I had a few yeah. interactions with Marty when I was there. I, I could not stand that guy. Uh, he is definitely not on the top of my list of favorite people. Uh, he's probably right underneath Jenny Linson. Uh, but he's, I mean, yeah. he's one of the most, in my 
humble opinion, one of the most despicable characters in the story of Scientology. I mean, doesn't stand for anything. Uh, just the ultimate traitor, a flip flopper goes back and forth. The guy's blown Scientology three times. He's gone back three times. He turned on all of his friends. I mean, he stands for nothing. He right. stands for nothing. And then the blackmail Scientology had on the guys, they caught him on tape abusing his adopted son. I mean, just the worst piece of shit, honestly. What, yeah. a, scum, what a scumbag. I, I know there are some people who have some sympathy for him. I got zero. Yeah, yeah, so do I. And that, that you know, that because that that jumps us right into I was talking to another friend this morning about this, and it was interesting because because uh she had watched your interview yesterday, which was again with Rachel, fantastic. And I just want to say, like, I watched your interview yesterday, and I'm thinking in my mind, I go at some point, I go, you know what? Since I've left in 2004, 2005, they've probably changed things a little bit, they've made things a little easier. There, there's no way they're still doing the stupid procedures they have for dealing with people that are leaving. They must be getting smarter about this because come on, it's 15 years later, right? So when Rachel told her story with you yesterday, I'm like, they still are that stupid. And they still have these same key figures doing dumb shit like Kirsten. And I'm just, I was actually shocked by it, which bounces into the question. You go, so, so we know Aaron from our, from our experience with, with Sea Org members, at least you've actually had more experience with Scientologists than I have. But Sea Org members, a vast majority of them are really good people that are working their entire life to what they think is a cause that is going to save the planet. But how do you then justify your Christians, your OSA staff, and the people that cover up crimes like the essay that, that, that uh, Rachel spoke about with the IT guy yesterday? How do you, how do you justify like like how is that any part of the mission? I mean, and, and even as you spoke about it in Scientology, that sort of act is 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 shunned. I mean, people do not approve of that. So how do you get someone that can justify in their own heads the ability not to? I can understand not reporting it to uh, the police because that's that's Scientology, that's scripture. But how do they not remove that guy and stop him from ever going anywhere else and kick him out of the church? instantaneously so you have you have these contradicting datums of of science Org members are generally good people <clears throat> and then you have a few of these people that that will cover up horrendous crimes and i've been trying to figure so i'm doing a little reading on that uh because i want to go well how can you get that now you and i luckily were not on positions connected to osa or hco which is where i think that's the beginning of you the uh brainwashing and I don't want to justify for those people because brainwashing is not a great excuse for doing something like that. But there is a form of brainwashing in that cult that eventually gets a person to a state of mind where he's okay with letting a known, am I allowed to say the words? Just, or just, say, I, pet, just say pedo. A known pedo to go back on the road where he has free reign to do whatever he wants with whatever family he wants. What in your mind, when you started say when you, you got there to save the world, can you justify those sort of actions? I know. It's a and, I, and I and I try to um, not be a hypocrite about this because I feel like I have a luxury of saying I was never on those lines and never had to do that and never had to justify right. that. And and I feel like it would be easy for me to go. And if I was ever put in that position, I never would have done it. But you know what? Right. Chances are I would have figured out a reason why it was OK to do that. I mean, truly, right. I, I I don't think someone like a Kirsten or even a Julian, to be honest, um, uh, uh, began their job, approached their job uh, when they were first posted, thinking, I'm going to like hurt people. Right. You know? And I know I was loyal enough to Miscavige that I would have done quite literally fucking anything. Right. I was, I was never disaffected with David Miscavige. No matter who I was disaffected with, no matter how shitty my Sea Org experience was, I always thought it was because people weren't more like David Miscavige. Like I was as brainwashed. I mean, I thought I knew the guy. And in retrospect, you're like, how could you, how could you think you knew the guy? You never met the guy. Like, right. what, you're, like how can you be so stupid? Yeah, <laughs> yeah totally, totally. Yeah, and, and I'm going to make that clear too. Just so you, I don't think I was above that either. I really don't. Like depending, I would have never hit someone. That's for sure. I didn't believe in that. Never would. But if I was dumped onto OSA lines or something like that came up, I don't want to believe that I might not have done the same thing. It's like the Stanford experiment. You know, I don't yeah. Who knows? But, 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 but actually, but, but, but to yeah. agree with your point, actually. Yeah. The part that is mind blowing, even to a fully brainwashed bubble dwelling OSA and Sea Org member, 
is where you don't declare the guy and kick him out. Like people get declared for talking to their mom without permission. And this guy has been abusing kids in multiple countries, in multiple orgs. He's admitted it. And you don't declare him. Not only that, you keep sending him out. I agree with you. Yeah. I do not know how to explain that. Yeah. Even, even, even knowing how brainwashed people can get. Right. Right. Unless, unless, unless it's as simple as they were just so terrified at what the blowback would be if they declared him and let him get the government, let Interpol get his hands on him, that it would come back on them that they were like, this is one bad guy we've got to keep close. Cause let's right. be honest, a lot of the people they declare aren't bad guys. They're yeah. just good guys who aren't, you know, doing what they're doing, what they're told. Yeah. And it seems like the truly dangerous bad guys, um, you froze again, dude. I can you know hear what? you. It, it's always my, it's always, it's not Did I really freeze. Oh yeah. You've been, yeah, you're frozen. Although hey, you're not making a, a funny face. face this time. That's much better. <laughs> That's my, you can, you want to back yourself out and come back in? Yeah. Yeah. Can I back it out from here? Yeah. Here we go. Yeah, you can. It's always my Chrome, dude. I got to figure out what the deal with that is. Yeah. It's always. <laughs> All right. I'll, I'll do a couple of super chats while he's until he comes back. Um, the villain uh, regarding tax point with Rachel, the treasury chief once said the whole base collecting refunds is bad PR. Oh, collecting tax refunds is bad PR. So they don't do it. I know that because she asked me to get mine because the GI was low and we needed to like eat, I suppose. Holy crap, villain. That is amazing. Can you um, email me at growing up in Scientology at gmail.com? I'd love to ask you a couple questions about that. Um, good old tech telex discipline comes in handy. So these super chats don't cost me a hundred dollars. <laughs> Telex discipline is a Scientology thing of not putting any more words into the telex than is absolutely necessary. That's the first reference to telex discipline I have ever seen in an SPTV video, and that is phenomenal. He's back. Okay, Sterling's back. Um, oh, oh yes, yeah, so we were Chrome. talking about, you know, yeah. it, it's probably, maybe do a Chrome restart or who knows. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> it's interesting to consider, it didn't quite occur to me until I was just saying that out loud, yeah. that most of the people who honestly get declared are, are good people, and the horrible people are the ones that they're like, uh-oh, we better keep this guy on sides. Right. It's because they're seeing something and they're reporting it and, and Scientology refuses to acknowledge that that could be bad. And they're saying, well, this stuff is bad. It can't happen. The people they're getting rid of are the people that would report something like that to the police. Right. Yes. And, and we also know they're a master at writing fake declare orders. So they could have just declared this guy for any particular reason and, and let him go. It That's just, true. Yeah. You know what? You're, you're right. See, we're trying to come up with like, explanations that make sense but the truth is they could have declared him in a way that they said hey we're gonna leave you alone we're not gonna we're not gonna pursue you we're not even gonna tell the authorities what you're doing but you gotta go yep and they wouldn't even do that and then later on if it if and when it came up they could say we threw him out for that sort of behavior now yes. of course it's going to come back on him why didn't you report it to the police they could have said priest penitent they could have cried yep. priest, exactly. priest penitent privilege and and challenged someone to, to fight that in court or something which is amazing. And because you think about it too, here's how illogical. Why wouldn't you throw that person out instantly? Because if you, the second you found out about it, if you kick that person out of Scientology, you're the good guy, essentially. I hate to say it because there's a scale of black and white on that, but you're the good guy for kicking him out. You took action right away. You may not have called the police, which is unforgivable, but you kicked him out. So how are they thinking that not doing that or doing that may come back and hurt them? I don't understand that. It's like, Again, how stupid or brainwashed do you have to be for that to be your decision on that particular matter? It doesn't make any sense. It's, yeah. it's, and it's beyond frustrating. I would love, and this is just a general statement for anyone out there <clears throat> who fits this category and would like to talk about it. I would love to hear from more like real legacy old timers, honestly, like your mom, yeah. on their thoughts on things like that. Because it's hard for you and I who are more, it's funny. I consider us to be more like the recent Sierra members, but we've been out, you've been out, like I've been out for like but, uh, 2006. It's forever ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, like forever ago. Like it's almost a whole nother lifetime. I know. I mean, there's yeah. most people in the Sierra have ne never heard of us and have no idea who we are. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's hard for any one generation, I think, of Scientologists to truly 
appreciate what the culture was like in the generation prior. Right. And I'm not quite sure whether I should expect the experience of the generation before ours to have been better or worse as far as how they thought of and reacted to crimes like this. I mean, I think it was Janice Grady who told a story of, of Mary Sue Hubbard on the Apollo found out that someone on the ship had done something to some underage person on the ship. And she threatened that person with a knife when she found out and, and made them leave the ship. And you right. go, how do you go from that culture where at least abuse of children was not tolerated yeah. to where we are today? How do you right. go from, from there to here? Yeah. I think they would have thrown them off the ship back in the day, to be honest with you, if that had occurred. Uh, like actually beached them, just left them in, in a port somewhere yeah. in, in Europe. I mean, that's, yeah, that's I don't what know Mary how Sue it did. It, you know if, what? I recall, if I recall the story correctly, that's exactly what Mary Sue did. Yeah. yeah. And, but you know what I think the difference is in my, my opinion, while we're talking about this, I think Dave has such a giant ego and is so worried about how everything Scientologically reflects on him as the leader of this wonderful religion that he's scared to do anything like that for, for the, the possibility that it comes back at him. And that's assuming, because that's another interesting conversation I had recently, that's assuming that he knows about it. Now, <laughs> we've talked in a million videos about how David Miscavige has his fingers in every single pie, how he's always on top of everything. But sometimes I do wonder, because I because again, your video yesterday was so fantastic. It got me thinking. When Rachel went in session and wrote her report, and sent it to specific people, including the RTC reports officer. Who saw it? Because I think they are so mastered at, at compartmentalizing this information so it doesn't go outside certain lines. And I do believe, like Dave was withholding information from L. Ron Hubbard back in the 80s, I believe there's people possibly withholding information from David Miscavige. And that's not to justify anything for David Miscavige. I'm just saying, I wonder how much he does know and how much people are making, sh uh, calling the shots underneath him in regards to some very sensitive information. I was thinking about that exact same thing this morning. And, <clears throat> and what I, uh, specifically, I was thinking about the fact that Rachel pointed out that at Scientology Media Productions, there was entire spaces dedicated to things like color of the fabric that was going to be on the chairs in a new ideal org building grand opening or and, and i thought to myself miscavige is informed of exactly what he tells people he wants to be informed of so i was thinking you know there's a chance that when that report hit the rtc reports officer's desk about the child abuse that she of course would never give that information to dave but i go but that's because dave's made it clear he doesn't want that information so the you know the uh, the guy at the top is the one who sets the priorities organizationally. Right. The guy at the top would have to go, I care more about the color of the fabric on the chairs than making sure that our members aren't committing crimes against children. He would have to say, I don't want to know about that, but I do want to have to approve all the fabric colors. Yeah. And that so that still goes back to Dave. If information isn't being given to him, it's because people have already been nuked for giving him such information in the past. If you're in charge of the organization, why wouldn't you want to be informed of some of the most egregious abuses so that you can make sure those people are dealt with properly? Right. And, and we're, we're misled slightly on that because we do know at the international property, Dave did want to be informed of every last detail for all the executives on that particular property. Mm. But outside of that property, what was what were his directions? How much information he get fed? We do know at the property, absolutely, he wanted to know about every detail. If he saw someone and said that person's out of ethics, he got a report the next day on what came up in that person's uh, sec check. KR. See, that's a fascinating point. Yeah, we already know Dave is infatuated with knowing everyone's dirty little secrets. So yep. this is one. Uh, this is an example of I would love to hear from people in middle management and senior management, former members of middle management, senior management of what was the operating basis? What yep. were the orders and and why? It's easy for us to make up the reasons like he just wants plausible deniability. But wanting plausible deniability seems to have been coupled with having no interest 
in making sure things like that were dealt with properly. Like right. you would think that he would at least want to be informed about such stuff on the phone and not in writing. You would think that he would want to make sure such things weren't happening. Why is he so damn interested in what type of stone or marble or fabric is used, but he's not interested in major legal criminal threats like child abuse. Right. Exactly. And so even, it still and goes he, right back to Dave. Yeah. And even if, even if he has it set up so there's no paper trail to him and someone eventually prints off the report and puts it on his desk, still no evidence he has it. Is is he involved in it? We what we need, we need it, we need Kirsten to to just get the hell out of there and be a whistleblower because she knows all those details for sure. Every little last detail about such activities. I mean, this girl's been connected to this stuff for over 20 years, 23 yeah. years, I would have to say. Maybe and more. by the way, for everyone in the Scientology bubble, we keep calling her Kirsten Catano. Um, I think Kirsten Peterson is also one of her names, and her maiden name is Kirsten J-A-R-R-Y. -R -R is that pronounced Jerry? Jari? I don't know. Do, Jerry, I, I think. Jerry. Is that her maiden heard, or was that her first was that her first husband? Well, I'm looking at an email here that says Kirsten Peterson Nay N E E. Jerry oh. and I always thought N E E meant maiden name. Okay. Okay. Hey guys in the live chat, does N E E mean maiden name? I guess I should just Google it. <laughs> I, I, I was born in a cult. I don't know what name. Means. I was born in a cult. So you got Kirsten Catano, Kirsten Peterson, Kirsten Jerry. It's all the same person. She's only about 40 years old and changed perhaps. Yeah. yeah. Uh, isn't it weird that Kirsten and Julian Schwartz, I mean, they're both our age or younger. Well, you're older than me. Yeah. You're an old. Um, yeah. Not and that. these are the people who've been covering up Scientology's crimes for going on 20 years now. Unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, like, yeah. But you know what? You know what? In some of these OSA documents that have been leaked, there are documents about James Barber, another Scientologist pedo. Yeah. Those reports were being sent right up to Scientology's top attorneys and to David Miscavige himself. What David Miscavige was being informed as to what Scientology was doing to protect james barber and to protect scientology from fallout from james barber and james barber is just a fucking actor yeah. why i'm i'm sorry i forgot to mention so besides the international executives and and, and the gold base where he wanted to know everything i'm gonna bet the other category was anything having to do with public facing scientologists that are celebrities or that are in the industry he also wanted to know and how do we know that because he was reading tom cruise's uh interrogation reports and auditing reports all the time. I think Tom DeVock has told that story. Yeah. How Dave would go up and drink his scotch. And when he would drink his scotch, they would chat. And he would sometimes mention something that Tom Cruise brought up in one of his, his sessions. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, oh, and yeah. here's the, here's the leader. <clears throat> yeah. Here's the guys, anyone that's, that's, uh, under the radar that's watching. This is your leader, David Miscavige, who has enough time in his schedule to one drink scotch while the rest of the Sea Org members that signed the same contract he did are getting paid $47 a week. This dude's got a $400 bottle of scotch. And I'm low balling that, by the way, because I'm sure I bought, because I bought an $800 bottle, doll, uh, $800 that I'm, sounds like I'm drinking it now, um, of scotch. And he's up there drinking at the end of the night, chit chatting with another Sea Org member in his executive lounge, which couldn't have cost less than $100,000 to put together about a Scientology celebrity's session that day so if you really wonder how much he cares for you it, it's not much at all the guy the guy's an egomaniac uh who flies around a private jet with your guys's hard-earned cash let's be honest he's yeah 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 and, and i I'm, mentioned I'm this in the something about that i'm gonna do some uh, a story on that uh sometime soon because that's a personal subject that I never understood being a naive kid while I was there. I, I, I would see Dave drive around. I'd be like, well, he's got a car and a motorcycle. Why can't I have a car and a motorcycle? I get $47 a week. Let me see. Okay, so by the time I'm 60, I could get a car. This will be awesome. You know, so yeah, there's a whole subject. Guys, he, he signed the same contract that all the Sea Org members signed. This is not his money. He didn't create the religion. He took it over in a coup. He has no right to all the creature benefits he gets from that. That is not how it works. He's a Sea Org member and should be on the same schedule, on the same rations and everything else like everybody else. Yeah. Just I just that. love the story that the reason ASI started selling those Frank Frazetta prints and paintings is because they were trying to recoup the $30 million Miscavige lost on a bad oil investment. <laughs> 
it's like it's like one of the best stories that as a public like if i were a public who's constantly being hit up for donations and i'd be like whoa 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 miscavige lost 30 million yeah. on a bad oil well investment and that's why i gotta buy your frank frizzetta prints oh man but think about it so do, let me ask you this aaron did you think when you were in did you did you see I saw them just because because I, I worked with Motorpool. I knew John Brousseau very well. I knew Yvonne Gonzalez very well, who, who was his driver. Uh, I didn't know about the private jets until later. But did you know that he had uh, all these benefits? Did you know about his personal vehicles or anything like that while you were there? Because you would have only seen him walking around the property. You wouldn't have seen all that, right? So my birthing on the second floor of main building uh, overlooked the horseshoe where Miscavige's BMW was parked when he was on the base. And I would see, I didn't know if it was his assistant or if it was a messenger or whoever out there hand cleaning and waxing and polishing that car every morning. And I got to tell you, I, look, I was a true yeah. David Miscavige believer. I was one of those guys who would have been, I wouldn't have cared if I knew he was flying private jets. I would have thought that was awesome. Right. I would have thought, oh, nice. You know, yeah. I mean, honestly, there's nothing, there's nothing. You could have told me David Miscavige was beating the shit out of people. I'd be like, probably deserved it. Like, yeah, I mean, honestly, I understand how people explain away Miscavige stuff. Um, yeah, I and still, so I. I still think, I still think I would have been surprised about the, you know, losing $30 million on a bad oil deal. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and, you know, and I, I believe I have a childhood friend whose father was in finance when that happened. And he said something about it. I think he went to the RPF for like, I can't verify that. I'd have to ask that gentleman again. Uh, but I think his father went to the RPF because he had questioned or commented on that particular subject. Yeah. I mean, uh, and, and, and that's how things go. <laughs> but it's interesting you say that. It is interesting you say that, that you would have. And I get that too. In, in my first couple of years at Golden Air Productions and, and CMO Gold, I was like that. I was like, Dave was was my hero. He was he was awesome. I mean, he just walked around and, and I was like, wow, I would love to be something like that. And this is when I was in such a low position that I didn't know about the goings on behind it. And this is when, when, and you can ask a number of people that were at the, the, that property during that time that it wasn't as bad as it got, for, not even close. It actually was kind of like, hey, this is kind of fun. Let's, you know, we, 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 we were able to order pizza on Friday nights when we got home and stuff like that. And I know, I know that does not compare to what normal existence would have been at the time. It's but amazing see, how much yeah. how much abuse can be um, tolerated if yeah. you just give someone a little bit of pizza. <laughs> oh my God, pizza and donuts, that'll cover it all. Mm. Uh, but I but I get what you're saying, I, I and I do, and, and I understand why people look at them like that. And it wasn't, so it was a thought that occurred to me while I was there, and I can't explain why. And it's actually one of the things I got in trouble for and why I was thrown out of CMO Gold was because I made statements to other staff about, and I believe I mentioned this to you, Dave's at the 1993 World Series uh, in Philadelphia. I, why, why can't I be there? And I actually said that because I didn't understand how he got to go do that. Because if I read the contract correctly and I understood the parameters, we're, we're working, working, working. So there was always a part of my mind that went, what the hell? Like, why can't I have that? And, and it's interesting. And and when you leave is when you go, hey, there are so many broke Scientologists that are struggling, that are sending their kids to the Sea Org because they really can't afford paying for them anymore into child labor scenarios. And meanwhile, this guy's flying around on a private jet and getting when he's in L.A., apparently this guy gets gets catered food from Nobu, one of the fanciest restaurants in Los Angeles. It's in Malibu. Like. Meanwhile, we're, I mean, uh, two of his pieces of sushi could feed 20 Sea Org members, right? It, it does get ridiculous. It it's does absurd. Get ridiculous. Absurd. It's, uh, and, and just, you know, I don't really feel that strongly about it. Can't you tell? Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, even stupid things like, uh, and, and these are things that I only saw after I left the Sea Org, of seeing him, you know, at a NASCAR race with Tom Cruise. I know in the regular world, seeing, uh, seeing something like that's not a big deal. But as a former Sea Org member, I was like, are you fucking what? What? Like that you you're you don't you're allowed to just go off and you're not accomplishing anything by going to that. Like that you're not forwarding the aims of Scientology by going to that race. You're you're driving motorcycles around with Tom Cruise. Like we're not even allowed 
to go to the grocery store on the wrong morning. Like, are you shitting me? Th small things like that really did get under my skin, but that wasn't until after I was out of the Sea Org. You know, right. I didn't, you know. Right. Yeah, someone um, reminded me recently of, a, he did a base briefing once uh, back in maybe 97, 98, where he'd gone to the free winds and he'd gone scuba diving on the free winds during the, the uh, June 6th events. And had had under, had, you know, he had like a four thousand dollar underwater camera with a housing and everything. And he came back with some spectacular pictures of a barracuda underwater and just amazing pictures. And he brings it back. We've all been working our asses off because it's the six days of events, all that stuff. And he shows he gets the whole crew together just to show him these pictures. How arrogant can you be, first of all? And it's almost like a slow brainwashing because you're like, oh my god. Look at this guy. He's like L. Ron Hubbard. He's also a master photographer. And, and you're thinking at the same time, you're going, but wait, wait, was I here working while you were there doing that? It's, it's, it's almost surreal to think about it now. And, and I've always had that conversation with friends and thinking if we could go back to specific moments in time uh, where, where we were at Gold Base or something like that, and if we knew what we knew now, and we had a little time machine where we could rewind it. I would love to get up and at one of his base briefings when he's talking to everyone and just get up and say, hey, oh, oh, oh Dave, Dave, I'm sorry. Just, just to be clear, you're yelling at us because there was a hundred year storm and we didn't do a good enough job to predict that. Like, I would just love to just cut him off and just change the, the whole narrative in front of an entire base briefing over and over again, like Groundhog Day. It's, it's a dream I have. So if anyone has <laughs> a time machine, let me know. <laughs> I would just love to roast them over and over and over again. <laughs> you know, the thing is, a lot of Scientologists, if you were to talk about um, things like private jets and a fleet of new cars and the motorcycles and the buildings, they'd be like, oh, oh, COB deserves that. that. And, and I would frame it this way. It's one thing to say that he deserves X, Y, and Z. But if you are aware that there's enough money in the Scientology accounts that it's not a big deal for COB to go on a $50,000 dive, um, diving trip or throw Tom Cruise a $400,000 birthday party or fly on private jets, then you have to acknowledge that for them to constantly be telling you they need more of your money, they need more of your money, the reason the new org isn't open is because you haven't given enough money. You're the reason we haven't done X, Y, and Z. If you're going to acknowledge that there's enough, it's okay for COB to spend money the way he spends money, then you have to acknowledge that it's not true that they need more of your money. That's kind of what it comes down to for me. Like, fine, he can spend all the money that he wants, but he can't at the same time tell the public that they just can't take the next big, you know, Scientology strategic leap because the public haven't donated enough money. He spent right. $50 million of your money on an office building for himself at the Int base that no one's ever going to see. Yeah. He spent, lost $30 million of your money on a bad oil investment. And how many millions are you Scientologists still being asked to pony, pony up for the new ideal org, whichever one that is? By the way, Sterling, I did a video recently about the ideal org in Austin, Texas. And when I heard that the Scientologists had to come up with $23 million, I just assumed that included the price of purchasing the building. And I was contacted by some people in Austin who said, dude, we've owned that building since the 60s. That $23 million was just for the renovations. Right. And those renovations were done four years ago. Oh, oh, oh and by the way, because it, it hadn't dawned on me. It's not a new building for them. It's the building they used to be in before they were told to move out so that it could be renovated. Now the renovations were done four years ago and Miscavige hasn't let them move back in. They're paying $12,000 a month rent for these shitty little office building, you know, 20 minutes north of the city. They've got a $23 million empty palace they could be occupying. Like this is how Miscavige is misusing your Scientologists money. So just stop giving them the damn money. That's, yeah. I mean, that's kind of my, that's where I've come down yeah. on it. Yeah, you've talked about churches struggling to pay power bills, staff not being paid. Dude, mm. I book, I've booked private jets before uh, as, part of, as part of my job. You're talking a flight from coast to coast, and, and he may be just paying for fuel and staff uh, if he's borrowing Tom Cruise's. So he's going he's gonna to lease the jet at a, at a lower price. You're talking minimally forty to sixty thousand dollars at the minimum, maybe closer to eighty. Just that money alone, 
let, let's say he flies, let's say he flies, uh, you know, jet blue over to the coast and, and he flies jet blue mint and he, and he flies it at, you know, 2,300 for a beautiful, awesome seat on that thing saves us, uh, you know, $67,000. If he really wanted to expand Scientology, if he really, that was really what he was trying to do. He could say, let me cut back a little bit until we get all these orgs up and running and make sure everything works. That would be a real leader. That would be someone that actually cares about you. Instead, again, he's taking these, these tax exempt dollars and spending it to have a lavish, lavish lifestyle. And Janice has told me unconditionally that L. Ron Hubbard, and not defending him, lived far, far less luxurious life than Dave Miscavige does today. It's true. Far less. It's true. And he totally founded true. the goddamn thing, right? I know, right? It's like, make sense with that, guys. Come on, wake up a little bit. Look at it. And Look you know, it. this fundraising, you've got you've got scores of Scientologists in Austin who have declared bankruptcy because they cannot service the debt that they took on to turn that money over to Scientology so they could renovate a building that's been sitting empty for four years. And Miscavige has taken sixty thousand dollar flights from coast to coast. Like, yeah. guys, you have to just wake up and realize you're being lied to. Like you're being defrauded. Even if you believe in OT powers and target two and full OT, you're still being defrauded in the here and now. Like that's, that's kind of what Debbie Cook's email was all about when she sent it out. Yep. You know? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> and it, it's not a Ponzi scheme per the exact definition, but it is because I think David actually knows he's never going to get to the point where he can return. Um, return the funds in that you're not going to get OT nine and 10. It doesn't exist. You're never going to expand. Look, the internet is going to be the essential downfall of, of Scientology. And I've said it before, whereas before you might have four or five books published a year that are against Scientology, but people aren't going to buy that book necessarily. Now everyone with a click of a button can access your channel, can access Mike and Leah can watch her TV show. Never before has there been this much information provided about this cult in such a concise, clearly understood way that they can't, they cannot counter it. They cannot yeah. stop. They're not going to get new people. And I'm surprised that some people stay in there as long as they do anyways. It's shocking to me. If you I mean, I think there. the best way someone described it to me recently is that <clears throat> the lowest hanging fruit have already left. The people who were going to be outraged at the information have already left. Now, 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 the saving grace is that I think a large, large chunk of the people who are still in Scientology are just under the radar and and uh, pretending to be Scientologists so they don't lose family and jobs and and friends and opportunities. And uh, I, I got to be honest, there's a part of me that really likes the fact that so many people stay under the radar. Right. There's a part right. of me that likes the fact that um, what you do, even what you do see in Scientology is largely artificially inflated. I right. was told that before the COVID lockdowns, when they were still doing international events, but you know, still re within recent memory, four years ago, five years yeah. ago, even at the int events, they could not get more than 1800 people to show up for a live David Miscavige event. And that's a different figure than what was actually reported in the statistics. Right. Cause the statistics are all false reported. Yeah, I was yeah. speak. I've spoken to people who were actually the ticket takers and they said, you couldn't get into the door without a ticket. That applies to Sea Org members as well. Wow. We couldn't get more than 1,800 tickets collected at the door. Yep. <laughs> That's in Los Angeles where there's more Scientologists than anywhere else in the world. They couldn't get 1,800 people to show up to watch COB live. We got 2,400 people watching us live right now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no shit. <laughs> no, no kidding, right? It, no, it's, it is. It really, it really is. And, and it's, that's why I think everyone's channels, everyone that's doing their stuff from, from Laura talking about uh, child abuse and, and being separated from her parents at a young age to Serge talking about uh, abuse that happens inside the buildings in Florida and, and interrogating uh, children or being the interrogator of young children to Amy talking about her stuff to Mark and Claire talking about the spy files and where shall I, there's so much of it is, is just information that's so valuable to hopefully turn people away from uh, a destructive cult, destructive yeah. cult. I mean, you can't name it anymore. And I do, by the way, while I was talking to you, if you don't mind, I'm going to pop this. I do actually remember an instance where I could competently say 99% certainty that, Dave Miscavige did get a report about 
minor abuse uh, about a form of SA and did nothing about it. So I do know he, and that was at the, that was at the int base. And, and I, and I do know the person that that was connected to, and I'm going to say that, that he did see that and did nothing about it too at that, at that point in time. So Unbelievable. yeah, yeah. He definitely does stuff like that for sure. Yeah. So we know that he knows, and we know that if he doesn't know, it's because he said, I don't want right. to know, which is just as bad. In yes. my opinion. Yeah. Yep. Okay, we want to jump through some super chats. Was well, let me clarify this real fast. I, I wrote this this awesome little tabby. So there was a question about whether Larice Lou, COB's communicator, was COB's communicator while Shelly was also there. So oh, yeah. I wanted to make sure that I I know for a fact she was. Maybe oh. it was a four year period, two to three years. Can't even say what years they were, but I do know Lou was definitely his communicator at the same time Shelly was his assistant. They would show up together sometimes sometimes it would just be lou and shelly would be probably up in the office somewhere but absolutely there was a crossover it didn't happen after shelly left and was that from your mom or i mean doesn't no that's from me that's for me i knew that oh got it got it yeah 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 i there's no question i saw her tag i saw her at several meetings when he would come up to the marketing unit at gold no question in my mind none Uh, now you start seeing less of shelly and more of lou but no question in my mind that they were both on on that respective posts at the same time. Um, it's the little things that hang me up. Why in the hell is COB's communicator shortened to CCR? <laughs> I didn't know that. That's not what we referred to her back then. Well, you it just called CB's her COB's com. com, right? Yeah, COB's com. Yeah, I've never heard of CCR. That's just confusing. That's the Celebrity Center. I have uh, a theory. Yeah. I have a theory. Yeah, okay. I Just like... It, beca- it fell out of favor to refer to him as COB publicly because it was considered out security. People would know who you're talking about. Uh, okay. So people started calling him things like Department 21, which I was <laughs> like, when I first heard someone refer to COB as Department 21, it's I so- sent a report to RTC reports <laughs> officer. I said, this is a D grade. This is a non-standard abbreviation. Does COB know that he's being given this name? And I got a letter back that was almost adorable. It was almost like, <laughs> oh, you're sweet. <laughs> yes, it's okay. Thank you. I'm surprised you didn't get, I'm surprised you didn't get promoted to RTC right then and there. <laughs> <laughs> if they didn't like, consider me a drug revert, I would have been an RTC. I we like this you. guy. Let's get him up here in his report RTC, writing. You know RTC what? had my back because they knew how much I loved Miscavige. Yeah. You know what I got to say, though? I think you would have been the best RTC reports officer of all time if you'd ever been promoted. Oh, that's the nicest thing anyone's ever said to me. I know. You're right. You're welcome. <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> you'd, you would have had it categorized. You would have an Excel spreadsheet. You'd be like, okay, here we go. <laughs> that golden age of knowledge program would have been sorted out. No, anyway, <laughs> that's so okay. funny. Um, oh, yeah. So, oh, 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 that's what I'm saying. So yeah. maybe COB's calm was considered a bit out security. They're like, no one will know what CCR means except for people who know. Right. It's know. funny. I remember everyone still referring to her as Lou. <laughs> like, like even, even like if they left, Hey, we got to get that information up to Lou right away. I don't know. why. I always know her as Lou. And I know you hate using that, but I always knew her as, as Lou. I actually love calling her Lou now because it makes it sound like COB is in a gay relationship and I know how much that drives him crazy. <laughs> That's why I named my video yesterday. Why do people think David Miscavige is yeah. sleeping with Lou? They People assume Lou's a man. Yeah. Oh, and I, by the way, I just want to say, mm-hmm. and, and I, you know, you know, I'm a big fan of Mitch's, but I, I do, I, I have to agree with you on, I think there's something up there. And, and, and from a Sea Org perspective, Absolutely. The concept that he could be possibly sleeping with her or doing something with her while they are not married would be outrageous to, to, to the mindset that was there because you got in trouble for the most minor things. You know, I mean? if you slapped a girl in the ass by accident, you'd get in trouble. I so, mean, yeah, I had to have an, a, a metered ethics interview because, um, you know, for the, you know, the brief amount of time, the weeks between, Uh, I met my wife and we got married. We were walking down the hall next to each other and I might have accidentally bumped into some side boob while losing my balance. Like that's the the kind of things that are like, whoa, whoa, was that intentional? Whoa. And you're like, huh? Right. When I first met my, my, my uh, wife at the time there, Suzette first met her, went down to see her. This was around new year's. 
Dave, I, I'm, I'm at Celebrity Center. Dave, I'm just happy to be there. I, I forget who I was with. Maybe I was with my mom or, or Justin. Dave's like, oh, did, so did you sleep with her? Have you gone out to eat with Suzette yet? I'm like, and, yes. and I'd only seen her once or twice. That's his obsession with it. So he, he thought because he knew I was seeing Suzette on the side that maybe I was doing something already. Yeah. And, and he always was that way, particularly towards me. I don't know why he was that way, but he was. But yeah, that's how obsessed he was with those little details. And and then meanwhile, he's he goes back into he's on a private jet and he goes back into the 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 bedroom section of the private jet. Yeah. By the way, just so you know, if you've ever flown a private jet, that's not appropriate. If you work for the person, you don't go into the same room as him. You stay outside and you sleep on the extra couch or the extra lounge chair in the front of the plane. You do not go to the back of the plane. Yeah. Ever. Yeah. Yeah. That's just not that's not typical uh, courtesy or or protocol for someone that is a staff of a wealthy person or a uh, celebrity. You just don't go back. It is a fa it's just a it is a fascinating conversation to have. And and I do respect that Mitch has his own unique and valid viewpoint. The fact that I don't agree with it doesn't mean his viewpoint isn't isn't valid. Oh, yeah. It's in it's interesting that his viewpoint exists. It's interesting that we have this contradiction and I, and I enjoy discussing it. Yeah. Um yes, you do. because let's be honest. <laughs> let's be honest. I don't know that I'm right. Right. I just the facts presented to me given my uh, you know my just my understanding of the culture I have my opinion. It doesn't mean I'm right. We do not know who's right. That's right. That's right. Um, there was something else I was going to say. Oh, 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 oh. You yeah. know, the fascination surrounding Shelly Miscavige. Yeah. The conversation gets interesting if they're divorced. Be Does the media still give a shit about Shelly Miscavige if they got divorced 10 years ago and nobody – like if, if the world found out, if it turns out, oh, my God, they're divorced – does the media stop giving a shit about Shelly Miscavige? I would say yes, because who cares if you don't talk to your ex-wife? <laughs> right? Exactly. Yeah, I so, mean, I have to agree with you on that. I, I, that's my yeah. opinion. Some people may take it wrong, but that is my opinion on it. That's how I that's how I look at it. So yeah. yeah. You want to run through some super chats here? Let's do it. Let's do it. Okay. Tana Sandoval, cookies for a Dodgers fan. What? Go Dodgers. Uh, we're going to get Arizona in the next round and hopefully we blow them out. So there we go. Is this, uh, oh, is this an inside joke about your, your story about the cookies? I just realized it is. It is. And where's John Satowski for our incidents? Because I, cookie, I don't have the any cookie today. incident. I forgot because yeah. I, That's number I, one. I went through the chat that me, you and Mike did, and yeah. I created chapter breaks for each one of the incidents. <laughs> and I knew, I knew I was, was number one. I cookie knew was I was forget. I got the elevator incident. Yep. I got the TMI incident. That was the last I got, one. I got the twin incident. And twin incident. now I got it. It's when you were like, you asked me if twins run in my family. And yes. Sean said, no, by the way, I want to clarify that. I was actually asking you, and that doesn't negate the fact that I I'm, I apologize. I did. Not, I it slipped my mind that you were yourself a twin. But I was actually asking if you had them generationally before you. And what and, I meant to ask. And it wasn't even until afterwards that I realized the answer is, in fact, yes. My grandfather, my maternal grandfather, was a twin. Wow. Okay. That's crazy. And also someone jumped in the chat and said, the generational twin thing runs through the female line, not the male line. I don't even know. That's beyond my ability to connect. Yeah, yeah, we're, getting, yeah we're getting to the weeds on that. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So I'm going to go back and add the cookie. Apparently your hairline comes from your mom too, but um, you know, your so. mother's father, your, whether you oh, go the, bald is father. supposed to be what you based on your mother's father. My, oh, you study this, you know, and, this. My, and my grandfather was bald. Yeah. Okay. Damn it. And my dad's dad had a nice full head of hair up until the day he died. Right, 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 right. Um, uh, okay. Orca, Oracle. Oracle one, uh, uh, David Miscavige is a narcissist and paranoid. He may have believed that she could. Okay. That's an interesting point. Yeah. It doesn't mean she really could just what his paranoid belief is. Oh, I like that. That's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. It's good. It's good um, it, it, it could be something as minor as if Shelly's down there with all those people, she could talk shit about me to them. And I don't want that. Right. To me, right. that's actually what makes the most sense to me. Yeah. And I hope from doing these, he gets the report and he actually has to start thinking about these and gets more paranoid. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Gary Mackey, after yesterday, still wondering where are your refunds, credits, and COVID payments? I, I too am fascinated. Uh, remember, we were talking with Rachel about um, the fact that none of the CIRG members, she as a CIRG member, tr yes. asked, she said, I need my info. I want to file my taxes. I want to file for a refund or whatever. And they basically said, no, you can't. Wow. And then it dawned on uh, both of us that 
what did the Sea Org do with all the COVID payments that had to be sent out to all the thousands of Sea Org members? Oh, there's no way those there's no way those Sea Org members were allowed to keep that money. No, for sure not. No, now you know um, why Dave has a new camera. <laughs> <laughs> Any former Sea Org members out there who were on the bases during the COVID stuff in the United States and no knows how the COVID payments were dealt with, please hit me up at growing up in Scientology at gmail.com. Um, Janda Panda Treasures, I love that one. True religious organizations are required by law to report abuse to the authorities. Church of Scientology must do the same. You know, I get all sorts of different feedback on this. Um, and I just don't know what the truth of the matter is. I, right. I, because, oh, I shouldn't even mention it. Was the Catholic Church ever prosecuted for the whole spotlight stuff? I don't know if they were, but that, that that's always the thing that first popped up in my head. Yeah. I mean, look I at corporations hide hide stuff as well yeah scientology hide stuff the catholic church obviously hid stuff they're always going to look out for number one they're always going to try to protect themselves first and foremost now if there's a law that requires them to do it then it should be enforced obviously but yeah let's let's be honest it's every organization that has something to lose will tend to lie or cover it up as best they can i just think scientology does it with vindictiveness and is much yeah. worse about how they go about doing it than everyone else. Absolutely. Opinion. Arnie Van Halen, where is the lovely Jenna? I talk to Jenna every day. I mean, I'm, I, um, she doesn't love doing YouTube. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to keep on her. I, I was like, look, I was like, uh, she just doesn't love doing YouTube. I still yeah. want her to do it, but she doesn't yeah. love doing it. And, and to be <laughs> honest, to be honest, like, so I've interviewed my mom several times now. She doesn't love it either. This is not easy. There's yeah. a lot of people. This is it gets it's hard to talk to a camera by yourself. Uh, props to you, Aaron. You do it so well. It, it's easier when I'm talking to you, Aaron. I could talk to you all day long. That's not an issue. I could talk to Mike Brown all day long. It is one. I do one, two, maybe three videos a week. It's a lot of work just to do that. And these are lives. So to anyone that's not doing it, you have to understand it is not easy to get up here and talk about your life. Uh, you, you're doing a live, you're nervous about what you may say, where you may slip up, you, you're lighting your camera, whether you freeze or not. So, you know, hopefully, hopefully Jenna does come out and, and talk again because she's good at it, yeah. but, uh, it is not as easy as you think it is until you try it. Yeah. <laughs> and it is funny. Cause I've been watching a lot of Jenna's old videos. Um, uh, you know, when she went on all the media shows, she, I mean, she did some of the biggest shows. I mean, she did Anderson Cooper. She did Pierce Morgan. She did the view. She did a, a whole ton of stuff and she is amazingly yeah. comfortable on camera. Yeah. Like she's just, she just doesn't seem to even care at all that a camera is there. She'd um, probably tell you she was nervous as could be about it when she was doing it. But yes, she actually comes across quite well. on camera. Yeah. She doesn't get tongue tied or, you know, anything like that. Uh, there's just, um, anyway, we'll see. We'll keep working yeah. on it. Okay. Uh, Severine F they put Mike render into the hole, but not the real criminals. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Uh, comma, ra coma radio. Wouldn't the concept of pulling it in children aren't really children being a victim is the worst thing, et cetera. Explain how they deal with crimes and pedos. They just think that more Scientology can fix them. Mm, that's all of these things, all of these things play a role. Yeah. I think it, they're also, they happen to be very convenient reasons for the organization to cover its own ass though. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. I it's think it's almost like a small part. Yeah. Yes. Everything plays a somewhat of a role. Yeah. Miss Kim, why can't someone report him now to the authorities? I think someone can report him now to the authorities. So, yeah. yes. Yeah. And hopefully uh, someone does. Miss Kim, is anyone reporting that guy from yesterday to the authorities like Interpol? If not, could it still be possible? Again, I think Miss Kim, was that your question before? I, I think the answer is yes. It is absolutely possible. I, I just, from personal firsthand knowledge, I can't say whether it's been done or not done. But the emphasis there is I cannot tell you that that hasn't been done. I just don't know for a fact that it has. Uh, Arnie Van Halen, what, is, what does this mean? Jiminy Glick, Tim Allen. Uh, it must be reference to the Tim Allen show, but um, I, I don't know. Okay. Hey, I, I was in a cult. I didn't watch TV in the 90s. <laughs> <laughs> Lori plays. Aaron, can you please ask Sterling to adjust his mic so he has an excuse to show his guns? <laughs> uh, no, I preset my mic today specifically, so I didn't get asked to do that. I made it closer to my mouth. But but I'll, here, how about this? I'll just lean back and be like, 
There we go. Okay. Good. Sterling, he's like, did you just see me as a piece of meat? Is that all I am to you? <laughs> what, what is it? I feel, I feel I'm not going to say it. Okay. Objectified. Yeah. There. Thank you. Rob Greenway, is the prison camp still in use? Can we like storm that place and break everyone out? They actually bulldozed the whole, they actually bulldozed those uh, trailers that were being used as the whole. Did they really? Yeah, they bulldozed oh, wow. it. Okay. Yeah, I mean, they, I mean, that's the thing. Like, it's so hard for the authorities to actually go in. Like, sci nobody can destroy evidence like Scientology. <laughs> and didn't, didn't Mike talk about that, Mike Rinder? If you went in there and you interviewed everyone, they're all going to do their, their David, you did that Molly video the other day well it was so bad Molly uh, where she, where, yeah where she was talking about what a good guy dave was and and the taco truck and and, and i was going to actually do a a version of that at some point i just have to build up my you know get comfortable about it but i wanted to do a pow video like that one. Oh my god uh, yes yes about oh my dave god. Because, we could do so many versions of them oh my god and i it's just, it's just so funny. Anyways, yeah, I need to watch the ones back. I also watched the one from a, a, a guy named Jeff, who's a photographer up at Gold. That was just, I've seen Dave just tear that guy apart. And then he's saying how Dave's his friend because he, he checked on him after he had a brain aneurysm. I'm like, <laughs> reason you got the, anyways, yeah, let's not get into that. But Jeff, David Miscavige, yeah. he's a guy who enjoys a good taco truck. Oh he'll God. sit down with you and he'll have, a grilled cheese sandwich. Yeah. And he knows no one when checks he, those. No when, one when he strikes you. He knows to hit you in a place where you're not going to show bruising publicly. He knows how to deliver a good stiff left jab, you know? And and I remember, I remember when I was there working with Dave, he would always look after us. Right after he hit me, he immediately apologized and said, I'm sorry, and you should get that checked out. That's the type of person Dave Miscavige is. That's why I work for him, and that's why I yeah. think he is the leader of my religion. Yeah. 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 <laughs> oh, unbelievable. CO Bill. Uh, yeah. This is Mr. David Miscavige clarifying certain recent misleading comments. It is St. Hill sized. I had been in the pool and shrinkage is real. <laughs> I love it. I, I actually, love it. I actually had to stop saying I used to refer to it when I was talking about the size of something. I would say it's the size of old St. Hill. And I would say that to anyone. And they didn't get the joke. So I was like, I had to stop saying that because it was a phrase that was all, it was so beaten into us. The size of old <laughs> St. Hill. Uh, yeah, no, I can't. Yeah. Guys, if you're one of the 2,600 people still watching, do us a favor and hit that like button. It is fast. It is easy. It is free. And it does actually help, believe it or not. Oh, you know what? I promised myself I would try to plug Mark Bunker's uh, campaign in do every I. video uh, if I had an opportunity. Guys, I'm going to uh, screen share this. Mark Bunker. OG warrior in exposing Scientology fraud and abuse. He is running for re-election for the Clearwater City Council. I have about a million unique viewers per week right now. If even a fraction of you throw a few dollars towards Mark Bunker's re-election campaign, we are going to plaster Clearwater with so many postcards, even the Scientologists will be voting for Mr. Bunker. Uh, oh, Mark yeah. Bunker 2024 is the website, and I've got it linked in the description down below. This has been a blast. Let's keep doing this, man. And uh, let's do more stuff with Mike, um, Mike Brown. Let's uh, let's see if we can get Jackson and do get his thoughts on on the topics we've been discussing. Love to do that. Absolutely. Thank, thanks for hanging out with us, guys. Thank you, as always, to everyone who watches until the very end. Peace out, we'll guys. Talk to you soon. Thank you. Okay, if you want to see my rock and roll songs, click right on this guitar. And if you want to see an, a different one of my videos, uh, oh, then you could click right inside here. If you have subscribed or not, subscribe right here. Bye!